Elwood congregation came forward as willing to share a summary of a book on racial justice that has impacted them and to share some of their insights into the text. Um, and so in this particular season, we feel like this is um, a wonderful opportunity to share insights and thoughts about, about racial justice in our country and how we can, how we can grow as thinkers and as doers and activists in this area. So there are a lot of racial justice resources out there. Uh, lots of books, websites, um, podcasts, and just the sheer volume and variety can be overwhelming. Uh, so as a Knollwood community, we thought we would bring three books and three presenters to this program to give us all a taste of three texts that um, are very worth our while to delve into. So our presenters will be Sandra Boyette, she will be talking about the book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. And then Kevin Mooney will be talking about Wilmington's Lie by David Zucchino. And Kathy Stillerman will be talking about The Water Dancer by ta Nehisi Coates. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce these three speakers. You know them, but I got a little bit more fun detail about each of them. So just in an effort to keep us connected and keep us getting to know each other better, Sandra Boyette is married to Gray, who is a charter member of Knollwood. She is retired from Wake Forest Advancement and is currently a principal in Stepstone Strategic Partners, a fundraising consulting firm. Sandra is a deacon at KBC and she's tutored at Bolton Elementary. She served on the WCC campaign team and the communication team that developed KBC's current logo and website. And she is a member of a history-based book club known as the Histrionics. Kevin Mooney is a retired public defender. He looks forward in this age of COVID to the day he and his wife, Margaret, can safely travel again. At KBC, he especially enjoys teaching fifth graders in Sunday school, my Annabelle included. And Kevin didn't tell me this, but I am sure a close second at Knollwood is chairing the Faith Formation and Education Committee. Kathy Stillerman is also on the Faith Formation and Education Committee. She has 30 years experience as a teacher, curriculum specialist, and middle school principal in North Carolina public schools. She has four grown sons. She's now retired and she enjoys her new career as an author of historical fiction and spending time with her grandchildren. So we warmly welcome our three presenters and thank you for spending the time and energy to not only read these three books but prepare a short presentation about each of them. So we will start with Sandra and I will go ahead and move to some slides about, oops, sorry, not that, excuse me. Okay, Sandra, the floor is yours. Thanks, Catherine, and I'm glad to see lots of familiar Zoom faces out there tonight. Um, if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, for me, it's been the time to do more uninterrupted reading, as I'm sure it has been for many of you. Um, over the course of the summer and fall, I took the opportunity to focus on a number of books about racial history in this country and racial justice or, or injustice. 
um, white fragility, how to be an anti-racist stamped from the beginning. And um, the most recent of these that I've read is Cast, as Catherine said, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson. Some of you may have read her earlier book, um, The Warmth of Other Suns, which was about the black migration from the South to the Northern industrial cities. And it's a great book if you haven't read it. Um, she is a New York Times reporter and the first African American woman to win the Pulitzer Prize in journalism. Um, Cast was for me the most illuminating book of the list that I just cited that I had read this summer, although every one of them was instructive, I have to say that. What is so powerful about this book is her ability to explain historically how the artificial construct of race we all think race is something real, but it's an artificial construct, was created and nurtured by Europeans and how slavery implanted an almost autonomic racism into the white population of the United States that still endures. Um, she tells us eloquently how white Americans have been programmed with unconscious bias. I know I am. Uh, but she does it without pointing fingers at us. And that's, that's really what I like so much about it. Let me give you an example of how she does this. You have heard many white people say, <clears throat> I didn't create slavery. I think it was awful. None of my ancestors owned slaves. Why are we still blaming today's problems on what happened hundreds of years ago? And why am I responsible? I've heard that a lot of times, maybe not a million, but a lot. So she answers this question with a great metaphor. And she uses marvelous metaphors throughout the book. And I'll try to go through this quickly. Let's say you are fond of old houses and you're looking for one to buy. Um, you've been looking for the perfect one and one day you find it. It's a big, beautiful old house on a lovely, large lot and you buy it. You know it has a few things wrong that need fixing. So you make some minor repairs along the way. But after several years of living there, you notice in the upstairs hallway that the ceiling is sagging and you kind of ignore it a little bit and maybe it'll go away. But pretty soon one day you go upstairs and you believe the ceiling is close to falling. So you have to call a carpenter who finds that you've got some bad joists that were put in by the original builder. They have to be fixed or the ceiling will indeed fall in. Now, you didn't build that house and the joists that are failing are not your fault, but you love this house and you want to live in it. And so you're going to fix it. And that's why those of us who didn't have anything to do with slavery must be responsible for repairing the damages, the enduring damages of a situation that we didn't create because we want to live in this place for a long time. So they're wonderful metaphors like this woven uh, into very well-documented history, uh, much of it that didn't appear in any of my textbooks along the way. Um, from the title, you can surmise that she compares the caste system in India to our culture. Um, she defines caste as an artificial, arbitrary set of rules that assign value to human beings. The core of the book is what she calls the eight pillars of any caste system uh, that form the framework to assign people by birth and by color to their place in life and never allows them to leave. And by the way, this is an interesting distinction. She says that if you can act your way out of it by getting an education, uh, by changing your diction, by changing the way you dress, by changing the way you present yourself, even by moving into a different economic group. If you can act your way out of it, it's class, not caste. If you cannot act your way out of it, then it's caste. So if you think about today's black professionals, for example, many of them are still not fully accepted only because of their race. So I'll run through quickly the eight pillars of caste with just a comment on each. I should tell you that every chapter is so chock full of history and current anecdotes and her wonderful metaphors. It was really hard for me to decide um, what comments to make and what I had to leave out, but I'll try to be uh, succinct. 
the first pillar uh, that is a justification for caste, and this will be of particular interest to an Elwood group, the first pillar is divine will and the law of nature. Not surprisingly, um, the word of God was used to justify the kidnapping, enslavement, and cruelty uh, to Africans. The colonists, even before there was a country here, the colonists saw that the wilderness needed to be tamed and work needed to be done to build plantations. They had been introduced already to this rich source of free labor, and they needed a rationale for it because they probably knew it was wrong. So they did exactly what people do today. Um, they went to the scripture to justify their actions. And they picked the story of Noah and Ham. You all know that story. Um, Ham was cursed, of course, and told his descendants would be enslaved. And Africans, therefore, were quite naturally assigned their place as descendants of Ham. There are many other examples in this section of the book of how religion has been used to perpetrate and to um, uh, continue um, all, all facets of racism and the whole concept of caste. The second pillar is heritability. This is about how you look. Um, members of the dominant caste, both in India and the United States of America, believe they have inherited their place in the caste framework. And outward appearance, how you look, your skin color, your hair texture, are big markers of your place in the system. The colonists even codified this uh, to determine who had legal rights based on the race of one's mother. Interestingly, not your father's race, as is the case in English law, um, but the codification led to the one drop principle. If you have one drop of African blood, you're not white, you're black. And an interesting connection that Wilkerson made for me in, in this uh, chapter is that the one drop principle was an incentive to slaveholders to have more children with enslaved women because those children would be black and would therefore provide more free labor for the slaveholder which is horrifying and chilling. I've never really heard that connection made. And there are, she's, this chapter is full of anecdotes, her own personal anecdotes uh, about how this, this still plays out in, in the world today, in our culture today. Pillar three <clears throat> is endogamy. Caste controls whom you can love, whom you can marry, and with whom you can have children. And of course, in this country, miscegenation laws flowed from this pillar and meant that your family could only be built around people who look like you. So one huge consequence of this pillar is that it prevents us from having empathy for people who don't look like us. If these are not people we love and that we're accustomed to being around and we don't regard as family, it's easy to not not empathize with them. And of course, that lack of empathy has led to so many uh, crimes and atrocities like the Emmett Till murder, when he was accused of just whistling at a white woman, which was, of course, later proved not to be true, but it led to his death. So she takes these pillars and gives us a history and then tells us what's going on today as a result. The fourth pillar is purity versus pollution. Um, in India, the upper castes have an obsession with being protected from the pollution of the subordinate uh, castes. Uh, the untouchables, for example, for years had to stay at least 96 paces away from the Brahmins and the, the upper caste. Um, this played out in America as Jim Crow laws and practices, separate water fountains, separate restrooms, I didn't know this, even black Bibles and white Bibles in the Deep South courtrooms. Um, and then, of course, it carried forward to inspire practices like redlining that affected housing patterns uh, well into the 70s, and for that matter, still does. The dominant class does not want to live anywhere close to the subordinate class, a caste. Sorry, there's a phone ringing in the background. Um, 
also in this part of the book, um, Wilkerson tells us that during the 20s and 30s, um, in the lead up to the Third Reich, German eugenicists were in close touch with American eugenicists. And one of the books by an American eugenics professor from Columbia University was called by Hitler, My Bible. Hitler, it turns out, and I never knew this, Hitler admired how the US had managed to keep African-Americans as the subordinate caste long after emancipation. They studied our Jim Crow laws. Um, so in a perverse way, we were part of his template for what ultimately became the Holocaust. Um, that was shocking to me. Pillar five is occupational hierarchy. This is about uh, the pheno phenomenon of the lowest caste being forced to do the most menial jobs. Even after emancipation, what one could do for a living became entirely tied to what one looked like, what your skin color was and is. Uh, kept blacks from even imagining that they could do something more than be a maid or a common laborer. Um, the civil rights era opened up, of course, more uh, occupations to some extent, but even today, Wilkerson says, reminds us that blacks um, had the added burden of having to prove over and over that they're capable of doing jobs that have been historically done by whites. Uh, and even right at this moment, we can see this pillar playing out in healthcare. Black and brown people on the front lines, bus drivers, orderlies, grocery store employees, uh, and other blue collar workers are who are forced to come into close contact with others day after day are at a higher risk for COVID and have been uh, killed by it at a higher rate. Pillar six and seven I'll talk about together. Uh, pillar six is dehumanization and pillar seven is terror and cruelty as a means of control. Um, she says that dehumanization is fundamental to the caste system. Once you've dehumanized a person, you don't have to focus on the individual anymore. You just talk about the group. You stereotype, in other words. The Nazis dehumanized their uh, concentration camp victims by shaving their heads, by having them wear identical uniforms that often didn't fit well, um, and by having them answer not to a name, but to a number. Of course, in slave days, Blacks were called only by their first names, and sometimes even a name you might give a pet. Um, in some southern states, their clothes had to be made out of specific fabrics that slave owners would never, ever use. <laughs> so since they weren't human to begin with, the dominant caste could feel fine, or at least not feel bad, about whatever cruelty or atrocities they committed against the African-Americans. The terror of lynching, of course, was designed to break the spirit of blacks and remind them that anything they did that was out of their place, AKA out of their caste, uh, could result in death, maybe even if they didn't do anything wrong. Um, one of the women who integrated Central High School in Little Rock recalled an incident from her childhood. She said that because of the way black uh, life was in Arkansas in the 40s, the one important and safe place for African-Americans was church. Um, she was at her church one evening when the Klan burst in, uh, grabbed a respected man from their congregation and lynched him from a rafter in the church. And she commented, I have lived with fear every moment of my life since then. Wilkerson, reminds us that terror sends the message uh, that resistance threatens your very survival and therefore there's no point to resisting. And that's a lesson that got deeply embedded into uh, the African-American mindset over years. Um, and pillar eight, which is really related to pillar one is inherent superiority versus inherent inferiority. Um, this makes it clear, understood, and is enforced um, that those in the dominant caste have inborn privilege, and those in the lowest caste were born deserving much less or nothing at all. Uh, before the civil rights era, and certainly continuing in more subtle ways today, I think, um, only those from the upper castes 
could be or deserve to be leaders. Remember when we elected our first black president, for example. Um, and in this section of the book, uh, Wilkerson also talks about how the civil rights legislation probably helped women as a group more than African Americans as a group and certainly more than African American men who have had a uh, slower and harder time making it up the leadership ladder. Um, the tragedy of this, as she sees it, is a great loss of talent um, to the detriment of every single aspect of our society. Um, that was fast. I have not done justice to this book uh, because she so skillfully weaves so much history and what I would call testimony. Um, it really, the book is really a page turner, I think. Um, she does happily at the end and the conclusion give some reasons uh, for hope and answers to the question that we all ask as white people about what we can do truly to repair and unify what's been broken for so long. Um, but I'm not going to tell you what her answers are because I want, that's the teaser to get you to read the book for yourselves. Um, I do want to let you know that Bookmarks and Wake Forest are co-sponsoring a community read uh, that starts later this month. So I'm sure you can go to the Bookmarks website and find out about it. I doubt registration is closed. Um, and in addition, I would recommend that after you read this book, uh, listen to Oprah Winfrey's podcast. She has an eight-part podcast about cast, podcast about cast, um, with Isabel Wilkerson and an audience who were selected as people who have had different kinds of encounters with racism. And I really found it fascinating to, to hear that discussion. So that's my quick report. And uh, I hope you all will like the book as much as, as I do and, and have learned from it. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that really excellent summary and, and report. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move to Kevin Mooney speaking about Wilmington's lie. First, I wanted to thank Sandra for that uh, articulate and informative report. It just so happens that my author also was is a journalist for the New York Times. Yeah. His, name, his name is David Zucchino. Um, he wrote an excellent history. The, the main title is Wilmington's Lie, but the subtitle is The Murderous Coup of 1898 and the Rise of White Supremacy. I grew up in New Bern, and my school books uh, probably mentioned race riots in Wilmington. They did not describe a violent coup, uh, coup d'etat on American soil. I wanted to learn more about the years of Reconstruction when most of the Confederate memorials uh, were erected. Let me apologize in advance. My report focuses on an election. Uh, Democrats calling themselves redeemers had controlled state politics for 17 years until 1893 when a fusion alliance of Republicans and populists took the state house and the governorship. In March 1898, two powerful Democrats devised a plan to regain power. The guy on the left who looks a little bit like Arnold Palmer, that's uh, Josephus Daniels, the publisher of the News and Observer. And he went, I guess by train from Raleigh to Newburn to meet with a guy named Bernafold Simmons, whose name was familiar to me because I was from Newburn. Uh, Simmons was the chairman of the Democratic Party for the state. And this dynamic duo devised a white supremacy campaign. Um, Simmons would do the organizing and Daniels would spread fear and dare white men to assert your manhood. The first political battle would be the November election when the state house and county offices were up for grabs. Wilmington became a prime target. It had a majority black population, had both aldermen and policemen of color, and it was the state's largest city. Three months before the election, the Wilmington Star 
published a speech by the wife of a Georgia congressman. Her name was Rebecca Felton, and she argued that a black man caught with a white woman ought to be lynched. Courageously, the editor of the black newspaper in Wilmington fought back in print. Alexander Manley wrote that some white women actually wanted to be with black men and white men ought to watch out for their own women. That editorial, as you can imagine, lit a fuse. Bernafold Simmons advised Wilmington's racists to use Manley's words to win the November election and deal with Manley later on. New Hanover Democrats organized both publicly and secretly. The secret nine bought a Colt rapid fire gun, that is a machine gun. Captain Buck Keenan, the uh, football stadium in Chapel Hill's original namesake, demonstrated the gun's firepower for the benefit of prominent blacks invited to the event at the Cape Fear River. The racists not only drummed up the specter of rape, but they also ginned up fear of black rule and, a, and or a race war, a la Nat Turner. Scared whites bought up all the guns in town. Following Simmons's advice, the Secret Nine conspired to take over city government by force two days after the November election, since municipal offices were not on the ballot. A local lawyer, this guy, Charles Waddell, rose to the fore. He had few clients, but he had a big mouth. In a fiery speech at Thalian Hall, some of you may have walked by that or been, been, been in it, Waddell told whites to choke the Cape Fear River with carcasses if necessary to free whites from domination by black people. On election day, red shirts roamed the state on horseback. These proud boys were the Democrats very own paramilitary group. Governor Daniel R Russell, who was not Democratic, a fusionist plantation owner from Wilmington, had to go home to Wilmington to vote. But on his return to Raleigh, he heard that the red shirts, these guys, were looking for him. So he changed trains and ended up hiding in a baggage car. At the polls, black votes were challenged and ballot boxes were stuffed. Democrats won all New Hanover County offices and they took back the state house. The day after the election, a notice in a Wilmington newspaper summoned all white men to the courthouse in the furtherance of white supremacy. 1,000 men showed up and Waddell read, a, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's terrible, a declaration of independence for white people, whereby most jobs held by blacks would go to whites. The editor Manley would be banished from the city and his newspaper would cease publication. The next day on the morning of November 10, 1500 men marched together and set fire to the black newspaper building. And you can see them with their guns and they all look very, very proud. Fortunately, the, for meta editor Manley, he had already left town. By 11 o'clock that morning, at a street corner downtown, a few dozen blacks and whites faced off. Shouting led to shooting, and three blacks died, and three whites were wounded. The mob quickly took justice into their own hands. White gunmen burned one alleged back black shooter out of his house, and then they let him run for his life before they killed him. Uh, he 
13 bullets were found in his body. Black people were searched all over town at checkpoints. A false rumor spread that blacks had taken firing positions in churches. So one of the two official militia, the Wilmington Light Infantry, aimed their big machine gun at sanctuaries while the churches were searched. By day's end, 60 people were dead. All of them black. No one was ever charged for any death. While the shooting continued, a self-appointed committee of 25 was engineering the coup, the takeover of the city government. Waddell's gang ordered the mayor, the police chief, and the aldermen to report to City Hall. And eight new aldermen were installed in place of the elected members of the wrong party, the Fusionist Alliance. The white mayor resigned and the new board replaced him with Waddell who soon spread his own version and to his own credit of Wilmington's lie to newspapers and magazines like Collier's Weekly. And here's where we get a local connection. By 1905, the celebrated Alfred Waddell would speak at the dedication of the Confederate Memorial that used to stand in downtown Winston-Salem. Working black Families in Wilmington hid in swamps, woods, and the colored cemetery for days. Waddell's gang prepared a list of black and white women, women, excuse me, black and white men who would be permanently banished from the city. 50 men were rounded up. Most left on northbound trains, but one activist black barber's body was found dead near the tracks. The banishment decree crippled the black professional and middle classes in Wilmington. However, the first Presbyterian church minister compared the great white victory to the conquest of Jerusalem. On the state level, within only six years, white supremacists reduced the number of registered black voters in the state from 126,000 to 6,100. As for Wilmington, its lie about race riots endured for over 100 years until a state commission set the historical record straight. A white elite had overthrown a duly elected government. This sad tale helped me understand why many people are offended by Confederate monuments and memorials to the memory of diehard white supremacists. This is a really, really good book. Thank you. Kevin, thank you so much. Um, all the history you provided uh, certainly makes me want to delve into this book. There's so much to learn about this history. And lastly, I'll invite Kathy Stillerman to speak about the water dancer. There we go. Um, so the water dancer by Ta-Nehisi Coates is the first of his uh, novels. He's a, a gifted reporter um, and has written a lot of nonfiction, but this, this is a book of fiction. And I often think that fiction, through fiction, we come to understand the harm of social injustice in deeper ways than maybe we do through expository writing, because uh, we just can feel the relationships and they're, you know, through the characters. Um, this story resonated with me on so many levels. Um, I guess, first of all, it's just the historical lesson that it illustrates about the hideous face of slavery and how slavery rips apart the bonds of family and friendship in an oppressed group of people. 
And all of this is for the purpose of protecting and supporting the well being and comfort of the oppressors. Um, so there's this kind of historical lesson that keeps coming up at, as well as many others. But then there's an intriguing plot. And the story is based on the life of a black slave named Hiram Walker, who's from Virginia. Um, Hiram's mother was born into bondage and then she was sold um, away to a plantation in Natchez when the, Missis when the Virginia plantations, the Eastern plantations started, the, you know, the land started uh, getting bad and, and worn out. And so, um, so this happened when Hiram was just a, a, a very small boy. Um, and it was Hiram's father, the, the owner of Lockless Plantation, who sold his mother away. So you can see the kind of dysfunction of, uh, of this family situation. Um, well, Hiram is, a, is, is gifted with a photographic memory. And this gift attracts his father uh, his father's attention, and it causes him to bring Hiram up to the to the big house to wait on his brother Maynard, who is the heir to the plantation. Um, so, ironically, though, with Hiram's gift of memory that allows him to recall every detail of everything he sees and experiences, he cannot, for the life of him, remember his mother, and this is just torments him. Um, and so. After a near-death experience, uh, during which his mother's spirit calls him back to life, when she dances on the bridge over which she and her fellow slaves were transported toward Mississippi, Hiram becomes determined to escape and he escapes slavery and he um, joins the underground movement and gets involved with Harriet Tubman and becomes a conductor on the Underground Railway. And he spends the rest of his life liberating his people from slavery. And so the story revolves around that and all the relationships that are involved with that. Um, it's very intricate and I'm just hitting the surface of that here. But then there's the setting of the, of, of the book and that is this plantation called Lockless Plantation in Virginia. And it's based on the, the uh, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. So you can probably visualize that as I'm sure many of you have, have been through Monticello and seen how fabulous and unbelievable it is. Um, but through the setting, the author conveys the shocking truth that those who tasked within the house existed for the sole purpose of protecting the lifestyle of the oppressors or the quality as Coates calls it. And the house would have been lost without those who task within. And I'm gonna read you a, a very short excerpt that kind of illustrates that. And he, this, he, he sort of takes this theme through the whole book. The tunnel where I first entered the house was the only entrance that the tasks were allowed to use and this was not only for the master's exaltation, but to hide us. For the tunnel was one of the many engineering marvels built into Loch Ness, so as to make it appear powered by some imperceptible energy. There were the dumb waiters that made the sumptuous supper appear from nothing. Levers that seemed to magically retrieve the right bottle of wine hidden deep in the manor's bowels. Cots in the sleeping quarters drawn under the canopy bed because those charged with emptying the chamber pot must be hidden even more than the chamber pot itself. The magic wall that slid away from me that first day and opened the gleaming world of the house hid back stairways that led down into the Warrens, the engine room of Loch Ness where no guest would ever visit. And when we did appear in the polite areas of the house, as we did during the soirees, we were made to appear in such appealing dress and grooming so that one could imagine that we were not slaves at all, but mystical ornaments, a portion of the manor's charm. But I now knew the truth. 
the masters could not bring water to a boil, harness a horse, nor strap their own drawers without us. We were better than them. We had to be. Sloth was literal death for us, while for them, it was the whole ambition of their lives. Um, it's kind of a tough um, interpretation, but I think something that helps me understand a little bit more about the the, the, the idea of slavery. And I felt like that The Water Dancer was not only a compelling novel, but I thought it really did offer some excellent talking points for groups such as ours who seek to understand the roots of racial tension that grip our society today. Um, and as tough as it is to read, and there's, there's way more that's, there's so much um, about relationships um, that just, sort of tear at your heart, but there are wonderful um, examples and characters to, to study to, for us to really understand the horrors of slavery and what it meant to, to families and hopefully probably to understand now today why people want the monuments torn down and all of those things. Uh, but I would recommend it as a book that you would want to read. It's fascinating as a piece of literature and it also offers just wonderful opportunities for discussion. Thank you so much, Kathy. Those were just three absolutely fantastic book reports. Um, and I'm so grateful to Sandra, Kevin, and Kathy, again, for taking the time to investigate these books and sharing with us so eloquently and interestingly. Um, it, it really reminds me that um, we, we don't know what to do moving forward to change um, the, the legacy of white supremacy and racism until we know how it has been instilled in our society. Um, and these works of nonfiction and fiction, I, I think, would give us excellent insights into that and give us that sense that knowledge is power. So again, Thank you very much to the three of you.